This video is sponsored by THQ Nordic. Thank you to them for making the video possible and supporting the channel. If you want to find out more about Desperados 3, please check the link in the description below. That would also help me out. Hello everybody, in this video I'll be doing a feature breakdown on the upcoming Desperados 3, which releases on the 16th of June on PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. There is a demo available for the game on GOG.com, so go check it out. The game is also available for pre-order, with the Digital Deluxe Edition on Steam right now costing the same as the Standard Edition. This Deluxe Edition features a Season Pass, which will contain three DLCs as well as the official soundtrack. Now for those who don't know, Desperados 3 is a story-driven, hardcore, tactical stealth game set in the Wild West during the 1870s. The game is developed by Me 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 Games, the studio behind Shadow Tactics, Blades of the Shogun. Now despite having this focus on story, the game is actually a prequel to Desperados 1, which came out all the way back in 2001, so no fears on missing out or feeling lost, this is a great entry point into the series. And in this video, I'll do my best to avoid any spoilers as I'll only be talking about some of the very early moments from the first few hours of gameplay. Now before we get started and jump into the characters, I wanted to first talk about the enemies, just so you're not lost as to what you're going to be seeing. So a typical enemy has a cone of vision that if you walk across, will begin filling up. When that fill line reaches you, you're spotted. If the cone has stripes, it means that as long as you're crouching in the striped part, they're not going to see you. And this is most common at nighttime or if you're elevated above people. So now that you understand that, we can explain the different play styles in depth. Desperados 3 features five unique playable characters, each with their own unique abilities and skills. Depending on the scenario, you'll be playing solo with one character for a while, maybe with two, or managing the entire party by using all their skills in combination with each other to solve more complex problems. So let's start with our main protagonist, John Cooper. John is considered a drifter, a gunslinger, and the natural leader of the group. He carries a deadly knife he can use as a throwing weapon or to quietly take down opponents from behind. Now, it's worth noting if he throws the knife, he of course then has to go and retrieve it. John also has coins he can toss to create short distractions, getting enemies to look the other way for a brief moment. He also carries two revolvers that carry eight shots and can dual fire them to take down two enemies at once, though of course, they can be quite noisy. John's also quite nimble. He's able to climb vines and ropes, allowing him to get to hard to reach places. He can also tie people up after they've been knocked out. Our next character is Doc McCoy. Doc is the more silent but deadly type. He carries a syringe he can use to silently kill people, as well as a Colt Buntline Special, which is effectively a sniper that Doc can fire over large distances. Doc also carries a bag he can place that lures more curious guards to it and temporarily blinds them when they open it. He also has to get the bag back if he wants to use it again though. It ain't I don't know. All right. Doc can also throw swamp gas vials which break open and knock people out in an area of effect around them. Now some of these things like the shots, the vials, things like that are limited in use and you'll have to scour the map for ammo to refill them. Next is Kate O'Hara. Kate's skills are based on distraction more than anything, though she can deliver a swift kick to the nuts when she needs to get physical. Never gets old. What? Better than a knot to the throat? I'm not sure which would hurt more. She carries perfume vials that she can toss that temporarily impair vision. She can flirt with the guard to keep their eyes fixated on her, or she could lure them away from their patrol for a short while by being particularly inviting. You hear that? She also carries a Derringer pistol, a short range but mostly quiet gun perfect for using after you lure some guards away. Kate can also steal other people's clothes and wear a disguise. As long as she doesn't do anything a fine lady wouldn't do, she can be hidden in plain sight. Next is Hector, a big brute of a man. Hector carries his trusty Bianca with him wherever he goes. Now Bianca is a big bear trap that somehow guards don't notice. <laughs> Placing it down kills the person walking over it and then it needs to be retrieved and reset up. To get guards to walk over it, Hector can perform a loud whistle that, unlike John's coins, actually gets guards to come towards him as well as distract them. Hector also carries a sawed-off shotgun, allowing him to blast multiple enemies in a short-range cone, and an axe that he uses to kill bigger and tougher enemies. Hector isn't as nimble as John, meaning he can't climb vines or ropes, but he can put his strength to use, carrying two bodies at once, allowing him to clear an area and hide bodies faster. And lastly, there's Isabel. Isabel utilizes voodoo magic, introducing a supernatural element into the game. She can use mind control to force guards to shoot each other and connect living beings to each other, where what happens to one will happen to the other. So you can even do this with animals for some particularly weird results. 
So that's it for the characters. There's also another layer of depth to the skills and abilities when you factor in the different enemy types. Poncho guards don't get distracted by coins, they don't care about Doc's bag, and they don't move when they hear a whistle. Long coats take three shots to be killed and aren't fooled by Kate's disguises, but can be taken out by Hector in one hit with an axe. We need the hair. Three down. Female guards aren't charmed by Kate, and they won't follow her when she tries to lure them. Because of little quirks like this, you can get presented with a lot of tricky situations where your traditional method isn't going to work. This is where the more nuanced, tactical elements come into the game. For example, without Hector present, a long coat can't be killed in melee, unless they've been shot, pinned down, and then hit from behind. So you'll need to get Doc to take the shot and John to stab them in the back, or something to that effect, to get it to work. For more complex arrangements like this, time is of the essence, so you can enter showdown mode which freezes time and allows you to queue up one move per character, and once you're happy, you can then execute the orders and just watch it play out. You can still manually control characters in this time and even fast forward to speed up enemy patrols or movement should you wish to get things into the right place. Now for those who like a challenge, on higher difficulties, showdown won't pause time, so you'll need to be a bit faster and get everything timed up and lined up correctly. If you've got two characters about to take out two guards, you need to time it so that they happen together, otherwise the alarm could be raised. And it's worth mentioning that getting seen or raising the alarm doesn't mean game over. You can still fight and clear out an area and then hide until things go back to normal. You can take a few hits, and Doc carries bandages to heal you and all the characters, although Hector... Well, well, Hector just drinks whiskey to heal. But let's say you fail a lot, or you're worried about things being tedious to do over, then don't worry. The game has a save reminder feature reminding you that you haven't saved in a certain amount of time. I set mine to two minutes, so that every two minutes, it reminded me to save, and then a quick F5 would do the trick. And if I got spotted, or something went wrong, a quick F8 would just load me back within one or two seconds back into the game to where I just was. It's very forgiving, and it's encouraged to do this often. What's even better is there are multiple quick save slots, so you're not just overriding the last one constantly. Which means if you find yourself in a bad situation, and your saves just aren't doing it for you, you can just go back a bit further, no big deal. You can also turn all of this off if you want to just go for a hardcore run with no fail saves. So this brings us to the sandbox nature of the game. Sometimes you've got a very clear path in front of you of what you need to do, but often, and more often than not, you're given a wide open area and you can approach it how you want. This allows you to experiment and get creative with your characters and with the environment. There are many items and props and narrative hints in the environment that can give you clues as to how to approach something. There's also a clear UI for showing you things that you can interact with, so scouring the environment can often allow you to pick up on conversation or show you items that will give you a new way to complete your task. There's now designated civilian zones that you can also run around in order to gather info without the fear of needing to be sneaky. You also carry a journal which logs your hints and objectives, allowing you to keep tabs on things should you forget. As an example, when we needed to take out Wild Marge, who was well guarded getting a private dance at the local tavern, we found she liked a whiskey, so I used John to sneak in and grab a bottle of laudanum. Okay, let's go. Oh, here's a bottle of laudanum. Take too much of that, it's as good as poison. Let's hold on. We use that then to poison a whiskey barrel in the back Cheers. of the tavern. Eventually, the tavern girl retrieved the whiskey, gave it to Wild Marge, and that did the job. So that's a little bit of an example of how you can use the environment to take out your target or complete your objective in an unconventional way. Though that's more of a subtle sandbox approach, there are scenarios where it's completely optional which approach you take. For instance, for the bridge at Eagle Falls, you'll have to retrieve dynamite to blow the bridge, which stops the train company and its men from reaching your ranch. In order to do so, there are two locations for dynamite, one in the north of the compound and one in the south. You only need one to do the mission, so it's really up to you which way you go, and you'll be presented with their own interactable objects and its own challenges. Once you complete a level for the first time, you'll then be shown the badges for the level, which are essentially the optional challenges that you can attempt. Now, they don't have to be all done in one go, as some actually encourage you taking a particular route over another. So you might be able to get a badge for going north, and then the other time you'll get a badge for going south. There's also challenges for higher difficulties, which can add more enemies in more locations, they can reduce your ammo, and actually speed up the time it takes for you to be detected. Now rather embarrassingly, I took about an hour to do a mission, and there was a challenge to do it in about 17 minutes, so there's definitely a lot of room for improvement on my part. Now to see where you're going wrong, or just a bit of a fun breakdown of what you did, there's also a replay system that plays out at the end of missions. It shows you where you went, what abilities you used, where you saved and loaded, and where you may have had a hard time. 
It's a really neat way to break down and see the kind of possible routes and patrols and also show you places that you may have never gone to on the map. Now finally, there's also something called the Baron's Challenges, where you'll be visited by the Baron who will give you special twists on levels that you've played already, such as bringing in characters that weren't there originally, limiting you to one type of ability, or giving you entire new objectives and mission chains within the levels. The last thing I want to mention is the UI, sound design, and overall quality of this game. It's really, really high for a game like this. The animations have actually been mo-capped, and I think you can really tell as there's great fluidity and natural movement in the animations. The voice acting is excellent, and it really gives you a feel for what the characters are doing as well as saying. As you can hear Hector chomp down on some stew, I could really hear it slapping off his mouth, for good or for bad. That's an old picture. How long has this hunt been going? Long enough. I'll finish it, New Orleans. Guess we all have our troubles. <laughs> Hector, it tastes amazing. Even the random NPCs in the game have little stories and dialogue that really brings them to life. Yeah, I got, I got something. Bill, uh, Bill was a good man. Never heard a fly. Beat his wife like there was no tomorrow, but who doesn't? The music as well is excellent and it really fits the period. I've been whistling it around the apartment as its catchy oh, tune has been right. stuck in my head for the last Wait, few days. Okay. There's also one sort of electronic yeah, song which doesn't seem to fit the era, but it fits the game really well and it's actually probably my favorite track. And I'm ready. Handsome fellow like you. We'll see. I'm here. Nightfall. Let's get going. <laughs> now for the UI, things are extremely clear and also have a bunch of quality of life features that raises the bar for the overall polish of the game. It sounds like little things, but seeing your radius for the noise for every action, and even for animals if they'll alert people or not, is a really nice feature. Showing a ghost of where you're gonna go when you queue things up in showdown mode just reinforces your plan, meaning you don't have to flip in and out of it to see what you're gonna do. Having customizable UI for how strongly things have outlines or highlights allows you to kind of tailor the experience and you can rebind all your hotkeys, which is the very first thing I did. Even the replay system, having custom controls to go both forward and back at varying speeds is something that's sorely missed from games like this. And that is it for my video on Desperados 3. This is a really high quality game that I've enjoyed my time with a lot and I was delighted to be sponsored to do a video on it. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.